got a great one today, you know, for a change. Olivia Nutzi is my guest. She is the great Washington correspondent for uh, New York Magazine, hence a great one. She's been out covering the presidential candidates this cycle. Uh, there's more than you, you might think, uh, because in addition uh, to the president and, and Dean Phillips on the Democratic side, and that one looks good for Biden right now, a, a little bit more on that in a, in a couple minutes. But there's, of course, a former President Donald Trump and Nikki Haley, and that's looking good for Trump as well. But there's also Jill Stein uh, running for the Green Party. Why do you want to win this for Trump again, like you did in 2016? Uh, there's Cornell West running as an independent. Uh, please don't vote for him. There's Robert Kennedy Jr., who Olivia profiled in her magazine. Don't vote for him either. He, he was a very good river keeper for the Hudson River, but he is a big anti-vaxxer. He, he just got the prize endorsement of the American Association for the Promotion of Measles, Mumps, and Rubella. Wait, I think I, I used that joke in my conversation with Olivia. Ah, you can hear it twice. In a report released Thursday, uh, special counsel Robert Hur said that he has declined to prosecute President Biden for his handling of classified documents, even though Biden's practices in handling them, quote, present serious risks to national security, and added that part of the reason he wouldn't charge Biden was that the president could portray himself as an, quote, elderly man with a poor memory who would be sympathetic to a jury. What the fuck? This is James Comey all over again, calling a press conference to say that the Justice Department wasn't going to prosecute Hillary Clinton even though he really very much disapproved of the way she used her private server. If you don't charge someone, you leave that crap out. You just say you're not charging them. How come when they announced that they were prosecuting Donald Trump in the January 6th case, that in addition to the counts, Jack Smith didn't also say, oh, and by the way, he's a malignant narcissist who cheated on his wife with a porn star, who he paid off and ripped off everyone who attended the entirely bogus Trump University. Trump took all these classified top secret documents to Mar-a-Lago, showed top secret documents to people like they were party favors. When the National Archives demanded that they all be returned, he only returned some of them and swore he had returned them all had his employees hide some of them and claimed he could declassify documents just by thinking about it. Shame on this guy, Robert Hur, a holdover from the Trump Justice Department, a Republican, and of course, you assign a Republican to investigate a Democratic president. But what this guy did in this report is shameful. You report what you have to report, which is the president is not going to be charged, not fill it with adverbs or adjectives like painfully slow in answering. President Trump's response were gratuitously obnoxious, palpably disgusting. What the fuck? Sorry, kids, for the language. I really am. I'll tone it down in the future, I promise. I should say that my conversation with Olivia Nuzzi happened prior to the announcement of the special counsel's ridiculous report, so we did not discuss that, nor the arguments in the Supreme Court on the uh, ballot question in Colorado. On that, I will say only this. The justices seem kind of scared that they would actually have to make a decision that only they could make. Did Donald Trump participate in an insurrection? Well, he exhorted the mob to go over to the Capitol and fight. You can't interpret that as simply fight like We've got to fight for people's right to vote or fight for this candidate or fight for justice. No, this was go over to the Capitol and fight, which they did. But let's be generous. 
Maybe he meant go over there and fight for our right to yell and scream outside the Capitol and make the argument that Congress shouldn't accept the results of the election. Well, after Trump watched them storm the Capitol and attacking the police, he sat and waited three friggin' hours there. I cleaned it up. Friggin'. He waited three friggin' hours before telling the mob to go home. That is participating in an insurrection. Well, we've got a great one today, you know, for a change. Olivia Nuzzi of New York Magazine joins me. You're now in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. And it's Las Vegas, not and it's Nevada, not Nevada. <laughs> you, you you knew that. Right? Yeah, I knew that. Because they hate it. They hate it when you say Nevada there. But anyway, so uh, it's not Las Vegas. It's Las Vegas. I, I know that. So you're in Las Vegas, and there was there a primary there? or No, it was a caucus. Is it sort a caucus? Of, I mean, <laughs> sort of, yeah. I mean, I'm confused. One, I'm confused, too. Um, so there is a primary and a caucus for some reason now, and uh, Nikki Haley was in the primary and donald trump is in the caucus i believe is the, the case um and nikki haley lost to um none of these candidates so so in other words he was not on the that ballot correct and there were no delegates to be gained in that race anyway i don't know if the nikki haley campaign just screwed up and they they applied to be in the wrong in the wrong race or what happened exactly. But well, this sounds like the screwiest thing I've ever heard, which is they have a caucus and an election. And one candidate just chose the election, which Trump did. He's sort of the only game in town now. I mean, Nikki Haley is not running a serious campaign at this point. She certainly put an exclamation point on that in terms of somehow not running against him. <laughs> I, would say she put a, I would say she put a, a question mark uh, next to her name. Yeah, it's not really a serious operation. It's funny that the press takes her so seriously. I think we, we're just sort of dying for something drama and yeah. conflict anyway to make it seem as if uh, Trump's uh, nomination is not inevitable because there's no content in um in a sort of consistent story like that. That story will be very consistent. And well, you see how uh, everyone in Congress is, all the Republicans in Congress are doing whatever he wants. It's inspiring, isn't it? <sighs> it really is. That uh, What a destructive person he is. Y- you've been on the trail, right? That's what you do. And you're the Washington correspondent, so you, you cover this election, but you're not going to be nine months on the road covering trump and biden are you or are you i don't know um i don't know how much joe biden will be visibly on the campaign trail um obviously last cycle um we were in the middle of a pandemic and so that was not typical um and there were not a lot of events trump is on the road pretty much constantly he really Mm -hmm. requires it i think psychologically to be in a crowd He, he gets that energy from the crowd he does. Yeah. He's sort of an energy vampire. <laughs> you can tell when he hasn't been on the road a lot. Uh, this came up a lot during COVID. Um, he really seems to suffer. And it's. Uh, I think it's important for him to sort of be confronted with evidence that people like him on a daily basis or a near daily basis. Right. And so he'll be on the road constantly, I assume. Tell me about these rallies. This weird thing recently, um, you know, like the last several months when you go to a Trump rally um, on the screens beforehand when you're waiting for him to come out, they, he's just started playing um, videos of Elvis performances. Really? Okay. Yeah. That's pretty, <laughs> um, I guess that's kind of brilliant, maybe. It's pretty on the nose, right? Like, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, not exclusively Elvis. There's some Elton John in there as well, but um, it is primarily Elvis. Well, at least Elvis can't complain and say, stop <laughs> playing me. 
you know, I'm sure Elton John was probably the first he's heard he of had it. a long relationship, him and Elton John. Trump had like a blog for a period of time during the, the kind of Trump University era. And he wrote a blog post celebrating Elton John's marriage. And they, they've known each other a long time. And obviously, Elton John is sort of a, a fixture in the uh, idiosyncratic Trump MAGA rally playlist. She's, if you go to a Trump rally, you're, you will hear Tiny Dancer at minimum like eight times. Well, it's a beautiful song. It is. And, you know, it hasn't ruined it for me. He's got good taste in music, if nothing else. He's got a uh, good taste for uh, a popular, what, what's popular with people. and It's very strange. It's like the Rolling Stones. It's You Can't Always Get What You Want. It's Tiny Dancer. And then it's like Memory from Cats. Which which is always jarring. Um, and, um, it's a, it's a very strange playlist. So, uh, is are the crowds as big as they've always been, or it depends on where you are. It depends if it's a nighttime rally or a daytime rally. Frankly, um, the the evening events tend to be better attended. So people are off from work, obviously. Yeah, I mean, although a big portion of the rally going public at a Trump event is, you know, elderly retired people. Oh, is that right? Yeah, but they're um, they're strange. I mean, a lot of it, it's a lot of tailgating. People just seem sort of happy to have something to do, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I always get the impression that, you know, if it, if it were a concert, if it were an Elton John concert instead in Sioux City, Iowa, the same people might turn up. But he just happens to be the circus rolling through town. <laughs> There's less curious. I mean, people used to come to the events and it seemed like they were just sort of like rubbernecking and just curious about this strange phenomenon. And it seems more like a social event for at least a certain segment of, of his supporters now. Do people leave early because of parking? I mean, no, yeah, they do. They're always streaming out. Um, right. you know, if he he'll start to drone on and on and like around the hour mark hour 15 people start to get antsy and start to stream out so how effective are these speeches i mean he 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 gives the press plenty of opportunity to go like holy mackerel he just said that immigrants poison our blood and things like that he he every you know or calling you know vermin and communists and fascists and <laughs> and rooting them out and those kinds of things how often does he give the press a new uh outrage to talk about it's interesting after 2020 and and definitely after the insurrection the media presence at trump's rallies really reconfigured you used to have all the major networks, you would have sort of the usual suspects from mainstream legacy publications from the major papers and from major magazines. And it was always very well attended in the press section. And that was a fixture that itself was like part of the staging of the rally from the beginning where Trump would say, turn around and look at the fake news media right. and the crowd would turn and boo us. And it was either this sort of semi-comical bit or depending on the crowd, sometimes it felt a little menacing. But then it changed. And now when you go to a Trump rally, it's mostly like right-wing activists who are in the media section. So you see like Sebastian Gorka and Ed Henry and you know people of that ilk. And so when he tells the crowd to turn around and boo the media, they're sort of <laughs> turning around and yelling at themselves, you know. It's not to say that no press is attending them. Obviously, there's still a presence, but it's not a must-attend thing anymore. anymore. And I think it's because the press was so um, criticized for platforming him and right. for, for allowing him to speak without, um, you know, sufficient guardrails. And so there's a right. lot of anxiety about the optics of covering him the same way again. Well, that certainly happened in 16, where any time Trump did a rally, CNN would cut to him. And they weren't alone, but I mean, but, and I remember t during that race talking to Hillary, and she said that she and Huma would watch them and laugh, you know. <laughs> that age well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, I would I would w w watch them and laugh too. I mean, too. I used to. This is terrible. I shouldn't even repeat this. I this is so embarrassing. But House Style at the Daily Beast, where I worked during the 2016 election, we would refer to him as future President Donald Trump as a joke. <laughs> and, Ironically, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
you know, without Twitter, obviously he's still posting on his own social media platform, but there's just a, it's more, it feels more like him shouting into the void at the rallies and, and on social media, whereas one tweet used to drive a whole news cycle for, you know, at least half a day before he right. tweeted something else insane. Now it's, you have to really seek out his commentary and it's not as um, central to the political discourse anymore for now i don't know if that'll change as the race sort of crystallizes i've, I've made a point of trying to watch them in, in part because they're fascinating how how much of what he says does it have a shape his speech or is, <laughs> I, I mean he seems to be a guy who can riff as long as he wants um yeah and i'm he... it sounds like a compliment but it feels like that would be great if he was actually putting out real information and there was a beginning, middle, and end and not just all middle. He has sort of like greatest hits that he comes back to. And so when, when he notices mm -hmm. the crowd disengaging and not you know hanging on his every word, you, you can sort of see that click for him. And then he'll say something like, what are we going to do, folks? We're going to build the wall. And he gets the crowd involved again in, in listening it's very interesting i i have a hard time once he starts talking something happened at a rally something happens to my brain where it's just sort of filled with static and i find it very difficult to to process his words in real time i think because they don't make logical sense just in terms of the syntax of his sentences <laughs> it's very difficult for me to to really absorb what he's saying in real time um and i'll zone out and then i come back and it, it's hard to know several hours what later. election he's talking about because he'll be talking about hillary clinton or barack obama and it's like have i been in a coma since 2015 and i just i just came to and it's only 2016 you know what year is it what election are we in um he doesn't like to talk about joe biden as much as he likes to talk about hillary clinton it just it does not animate him as much it does not animate his audience as much and so he'll sort of fall back into rhetoric that made much more sense a few years ago he lost to joe biden and he yeah. beat hillary clinton so that and she's just not as good of a i mean i think this is part of why he lost to joe biden he never landed on a way to talk about him he couldn't even decide on a nickname you know he didn't know if he was sleepy joe or creepy joe two diametrically opposed ideas and his audience i mean i think it's why he talks about hunter biden so much because he is a um, a better villain than joe biden and uh, a better character. And even I was at the border a few days ago in Arizona looking for the um, MAGA trucker caravan that was supposed to be rolling through. Um, and they never they never showed up. But all of the uh, merchandise at this rally, I mean, most of it was about Hillary Clinton and Kamala Harris and not Joe My Biden. God. You, of course, were in New Hampshire for the New Hampshire primary, right? Yes. Were you at the speech he gave? you know, his victory speech. I was not at his victory speech, no. But did you see it? Did you get a chance yeah, to see course, it? Yeah, of course. That was pretty bizarre, I thought. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of, it reminded me of um, when he used to like book himself on Entertainment Tonight and would just sort of riff Joan Rivers style about pop culture for a couple of minutes for segments. I mean, he just sort of likes to be a commentator. But it was all attacking her. Attacking her, her, yeah. And she actually said he won uh, this. He deserves it. You know, he earned it. He, she said that. And then started saying about how, you know, they did pretty well. And it was a good night for them, too. And that's what you do when you lose, right? You, that's a, not extraordinary at all. And he went after her very strongly for some yeah. reason. Well, I think she's a good villain and he kind of, he needs to have an opponent and his crowd is animated when he's attacking her. She's also a good opponent if she's going in the part of the Nevada primary or whatever their voting system is, the part that doesn't actually give delegates. <laughs> yeah, they really, uh, they did a great job on that. So how, how, how far away are we from South Carolina? And that'll... Uh, basically put the exclamation point on it it's uh february 24th and that is a saturday yes that is a saturday 
Um, I, I, mean, I find it difficult to believe she's polling so poorly right now. I have a hard time believing that she's going to stay in to be humiliated in her home state. I know. I uh, obviously both senators and the governor are backing Trump, but somehow I, I I think of her as a successful two-term governor who took a what in the South is a courageous stand to take the Confederate flag down. Of course, in the Republican primary, maybe that that's they hold that against her. I guess. You know, I find her to be very. A- very weak when you listen to her speak and you watch her speak, you go to her events. She doesn't have a great pitch. I mean, her pitch in New Hampshire was basically, I'm Nikki Haley and I'm not Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Whereas he was campaigning just in advertising, which, you know, he can't be this disciplined when he's speaking live. Um, But he was campaigning against her on the issues um, in advertising. They were sort of pretty relentless, calling her weak on immigration and running to her left on social security and the safety net and saying that Nikki Haley wants to to take your social security away. Wow. I didn't know that was part of her platform. Um, and she didn't have any response and at least in, in the way that she was advertising herself to voters there. So I don't, I don't know if that really mattered. I, I don't know how well, much you- Trump's voters are really animated by policy, right? Uh, they might just really love him and hate anyone challenging him, but she's not super compelling, you know, just in a retail politics sense. I think that Democrats make the mistake when they see her in very small bites, right? That she goes like, "Oh, well, she sounds really sensible and <laughs> and uh, and well spoken." And uh, well, it's sort of like I don't know, like the tallest building in Omaha or the skinniest uh-huh. kid at Fat Camp. It's very easy to seem very sensible uh, when you're being compared to Donald Trump. So uh, she famously has gotten a lot of money, right? I mean, uh, support from people with a lot of money. Yeah. So uh, my, my question is, why isn't she running ads? I mean, that's what... Oh, she was running ads. They just they just weren't very good. She was running ads, basically introducing herself um, to voters. Uh-huh. Um, but I mean, I think there's just a sort of establishment donor class and what they want is very different from what the majority of the Republican electorate wants. But she should be able to hire people who know what the Republican electorate wants and makes ads that appeal to them. I think that what they want is Donald Trump. <laughs> okay, well that's that's a that's great what I mean. That thought. seems to be <laughs> seems to be what the what the results so far and what the polling suggests. So now, what percentage of the party is? I mean, have you looked at these polls, or have you gotten a sense of it on the road? What percentage of Republicans, people who identify as Republicans, are Trump supporters? Is it like 80 percent now or is it or maybe not? But her vote, she got she did very well with independents and he did very well with Republicans. So the margin in that state, while it was only what, 13 points or something like that, 12 points or 11 something, it's really in Republican primary is going to be much wider, right? Yeah. I mean, his favorability among Republicans is extraordinarily high. I mean, I think it's like closer to 90% or, you know, in the the high 80s. Really? Yeah. And what percentage believe of the people you talk to, this is an informal poll, your poll, what percentage of the people you meet that identify as Republicans believe that Trump won the election? Oh, the majority of them. And even the ones who don't think, I mean, even the ones who seem sort of more um, reasonable mm-hmm. and and um, less sort of the stereotypical MAGA rally goer, um, they still believe that there was some manipulation if there was not like outright theft. Wow. Wow. Because you, you think about what you have, the thought process you have to go through to get to that. Well, I think we just have this dynamic in the country right now where there are a lot of people, not just on the right, on the left as well, who are deeply distrustful of government and deeply distrustful of institutions. And 
Mm -hmm. I think you see that reflected in how, you know, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is polling, for instance, right now. Let's talk about him because you wrote uh, a great piece about him, I will say. Thank you. Yeah, no. uh, And I know I know Bobby from an earlier time when he was a river keeper. And that was sort of the environment was his main issue. And he was very critical of the Bush administration in terms of all the people that Republicans normally put in charge of anything that has to do with the environment, the interior secretary, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, always put people from the oil industry or whatever in, in, in charge of those things. And he was a real champion on the environment. What the hell happened to Bobby? Uh, that's a loaded question, I know. I shouldn't ask it that way. Tell me about Bobby. <laughs> um, I, don't, I didn't know him in his previous um, incarnation. incarnation that you're, you're talking about. I was listening to um, an interview or a conversation with um, Theo Vaughn and uh, I think Tom Dillon last week. And they were joking around about how people wonder why he's so skeptical of the government when he believes that the government murdered his uncle and his father, right? That would make you very skeptical of the government. Did he lay out the case for for that, by the way, to you? He has. Uh, I mean, he wrote, he wrote a book where where he lays out the case that um, you know Sirhan Sirhan did not act alone, and he actually advocated for his his release from prison. He seems to really be tapping into what we were just talking about, which is this skepticism of, of government generally and skepticism of powerful institutions. He just won a big endorsement, by the way, from the American Society for the Advancement of Measles, Mumps, and Rubella. <laughs> um, it's interesting. He's got this new book out now where he lays out the case on that vaccine? COVID. That, yeah, it's about COVID, but it's not... I sort of... I guess I didn't fully grasp what his theory was about COVID before. I thought it was just, you know, about pharmaceutical companies and the vaccine being dangerous, et cetera. And the theory is more that there is a a big conspiracy between the pharmaceutical companies, the American government, and our military industrial complex to create bioweapons, chemical weapons. And that that's what a lot of the vaccine development is really about. And that COVID originated as as part of this research to develop weapons. So it's this sort of um, very far reaching government conspiracy. government conspiracy that I think is very appealing to a lot of people who suspect that the government is not operating uh, in a in an honest, transparent, noble way. The theory of it got out of the lab in Wuhan is not an absolutely crazy theory, but no, it doesn't not it, at all. But it doesn't involve the United States government deliberately creating a weapon. I mean, that's pretty <laughs> uh, pretty far out there uh, theory. But I mean, I think the the difficulty for like traditional political reporters engaging with this and trying to cover this is, you know, if someone told me that that was their theory, I could say, well, that sounds pretty far out there, as you just say, but I don't fucking know, right? Like, I don't, I don't have any evidence that I could argue with against that theory or, or for it, right? So it's very difficult to, there's sort of a whole contrary um, set of facts that people in the, uh, they would say, vaccine skeptical community um, are dealing with. And it's very difficult to have a conversation where you really reach any sort of satisfying conclusion with the person you're conversing with when you have two entirely different universes of facts. It's like trying to argue with a climate denier. Yeah, I mean, or anything else. And and there's a, and there's a lot of truth to what they have to say, too. I mean, I don't think anyone can look at the opioid ep- epidemic and say, no, we should trust the pharmaceutical companies, right? They they right. have our best interest at heart. They're not just obsessed with profits and they, they do care about us. Of course, that's that's ridiculous, right? And these people are taking that further to say that they have explicitly nefarious intentions, right? 
but it's it's like having a conversation with i mean i've been at rallies with you know qAnon supporters and it's it's very difficult if they say that there is a an elite cabal who commits sex crimes against minors i mean that's true sure we have the jeffrey epstein logs um so it's hard to uh, it's hard to fully argue with people when they have there is at least a grain of truth to to what they're saying yeah and of course i believe that too that the elite drink the blood of these kids <laughs> and that's kidnap. just a friday night for you right uh, that that's the i mean when you look at point to jeffrey epstein and you look at that and you go like okay i i understand that i understand what was happening there it was awful it's you know what a hideous person he he was but that's so far afield from there are these elites who kidnap kids and keep them in basements and take their blood and drink it. But that's a big part of QAnon, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I always mistakenly think that you can sort of argue on the, the minor factual things. So for instance, Comet Ping Pong, um, there is no basement <laughs> there. There's no basement there, right? Yeah. So if, if they were keeping kids there, uh, it would have to be out back or something, but there is no basement. Um, and I have found just anecdotally that um, uh, these people do not care. Now, the guy who went there and shot off his, his gun a couple times, I guess, is he, do you, uh, you, why would you know this? Is he still in prison? Why would I know that? Well, why I, would you know whether know. he's still in prison? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going like, wait a minute, why am I asking? <laughs> Oh, hold you're on. Beat. Let me call him. I don't yeah, know. you're beat. Well, you're the Washington correspondent, right? So that happened in Washington. I would yeah. think that you would attract the guy who, the crazy guy who did that. But boy, when he found out there was no basement there, he must have been pissed. Yeah, I don't think uh, I don't think he was having a good day. Yeah. Well, so uh, nine more months. <laughs> That's what we're saying. Um, it's going to be a close election. Yeah, what do you think is going to happen? I think it's going to. Uh, I, I I don't know where the margins are right now in terms of Trump, just Trump directly versus uh, Biden, and what the mix of other people does to it. So I I think when you put other people in, it widens the margin, and the margin seems to be pretty small, like three percent or four percent or something like that. When I see the polling and there's a long way to go but it does make me nervous when all these third parties are in that and mansion is talking about maybe no labels i don't know yeah i mean if you think back to 2016 it did not take very much for a combination of gary johnson and jill stein to yep. really screw things up for hillary clinton in a handful of states no that's that was the margin of victory, and I yeah. also remember, you know, Ralph Nader in Florida got like ninety thousand votes or something. So right. all that makes me very, very nervous. Yeah, and and Robert F. Kennedy uh, is is polling much better than certainly Jill Stein or Gary Johnson ever were. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's a lot of reason for the major parties to be very nervous. Yep. How do you feel about how Joe Biden seems right now? Well. You know, we were talking about the energy of him at rallies, of Trump at rallies, that he you called him a, a energy vampire. Is that what you called him? Probably. Yeah. You know, while he's doing that, Biden is, you know, on the phone to go, you know, talking to the cutter and trying to figure, negotiate stuff and created the coalition that that behind Ukraine he's doing that kind of thing. So that takes a lot of energy, but it's not the kind of energy that people see. And so I just hope that they run an effective campaign and can show all of his accomplishments, which are, and, and the economy is recovering, uh, recovering. It's been expanding uh, since he's been there, basically, right? He's created over 16 million new jobs. So I sound like a, you know, an ad here. But yeah, you do. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I'm want curious. him to win. <laughs> I want him to win. I'm curious. I have a question for you. Um, you were talking about watching Trump rallies in 2016 and, and laughing as, as we all did. He seems impossible to satirize. He's very hard to satirize. Um, yeah. 
is humor not an effective weapon against somebody like that? I don't know if it's an effective weapon. You can use it certainly with, you know, I I do comedy and I do go to nightclubs and and I'm about to go on on a kind of a tour and I use some Trump stuff and they laugh at it, but it's it's not I don't do an impression of him and I I think that the guy who is on Saturday Night Live does a great impression, but it's not satirizing him other than his way of just randomly saying stuff, which is what you were talking about. So no, I, I it's it's been really hard to get a handle on him and really do any any damage. So wait, can you can you tell me a Trump joke? Uh, no, I'm not going to do that right, right now. <laughs> this has been terrific. <laughs> And I, yeah, yeah. Um, Has it? Have we learned anything? Yeah, I think we learned a lot. I think we learned a lot and had fun. It's like camp. That's what you do at camp. Oh, I, I've never been to camp. Me neither, but that's what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> I never was at summer camp. My parents didn't fork over money for me to go to summer camp. Yeah, we camp. were poor. I can't yeah. relate. Um. Well, Olivia, thank you. I, I, I've been very happy with this. You anything you want that we? <laughs> well, I, wa- I wanted your I wanted your tight five, but you're you're refusing my tight five. Okay. <laughs> oh, uh, I I do a thing about uh, how he thought <laughs> when when he said all I need is eleven thousand seven hundred and eighty votes <laughs> that he thought um, Raffensperger was going to do that <laughs> and that he thought uh, Raffensperger was going to have a press conference where he says. Uh, uh, there's a, been a new tally here in in Georgia, and the new winner by one vote is <laughs> Donald Trump. I mean, how did how did Trump actually believe that call was going to do him any good, and how did he not know that it was being recorded? Well, listen, it was a perfect call, so I think he thought it was a uh, everyone would love it if it were being recorded. It's interesting though; I think it works often enough for him. That he he's sort of he's a cockeyed optimist, you know. Uh, well, uh, that's that's not how I think of him as a cockeyed <laughs> optimist. That's a lyric in a song. I'm just a cockeyed optimist. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Bum. I always like to end on 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 a, a song. That's part of my act. Is I do it, uh, <laughs> I close with a song. That was beautiful. Thank you. Well, I I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. Mm